Welcome to Faith on Film, where we raid your church library in search of the good stuff. I'm Nathan. And I'm Stephanie. There's no doubt about it. The Bible has held a fascination with filmmakers ever since the birth of celluloid. Directors from all across time and all around the world have taken a shot at interpreting these classic stories for a new audience, and many have been very successful. This, however, requires some creative liberties to be taken with the source material, as many Bible stories are very short and don't really meet the requirements of a three-act structure on their own, which is perfectly understandable. However, every now and then you get some of these creative choices that are just... well, they're weird. You find yourself scratching your head and just kind of going, what were they thinking? So we're here today to pay tribute to some of those decisions. These are the top 10 strange Bible movie choices. Bible slide now, y'all. Now it's time to get holy. Get right now to the left. Number 10, Gay Herod, The Passion of the Christ. We didn't even bring this scene up when we reviewed The Passion because it doesn't really affect the quality of the film, but my word is it strange. Herod Antipas is played like a flamingly gay man. He's effeminate, wears a fabulous wig, shaves his beard in a way that is not masculine at all, and appears to be in the middle of a party which might be intended to be an orgy. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if that's what Mel Gibson had in mind. And all of this is old-style Hollywood for coded gay. He's even seen flirting with Jesus. Seriously, next time you watch it, just listen to the way he says, Could you work a miracle for me? This flies in the face of Herod, both in the Gospels and in secular history, who is, whose predominant character trait is being controlled by the women in his life through their sexual appeal. Heck, his most famous scene in the Bible is having John the Baptist executed after Salome does a sexy dance for him. And before we get too far, let's clear this up. The 73 Jesus Christ Superstar did a similar thing with Herod. Here's the difference, though. One is a big, loud, sometimes campy rock opera. The other is a dark, gritty, ostensibly historically accurate drama. One can get away with this, the other cannot. Number nine. Moses, Nefertiri, Ramesses, Love Triangle, The Ten Commandments. Now let's get this one thing out of the way. Just because a movie is appearing on this list does not necessarily mean that we think it's a bad movie. But even good movies make some odd choices sometimes. The Ten Commandments is one of the biggest biblical epics of all time. Visually, musically, it is, it is considered one of the greatest movies ever made, and rightly so. It has earned that reputation. But I gotta admit, it's a little strange that somebody took a look at this story of slavery, brotherhood, God, power, loyalty, heritage, miracles, plagues, and said, you know what's missing? A love triangle. Let's make Ramesses' eventual wife be torn between him and Moses. Because love triangles will never, ever, ever get old and cliché. Personally, I'm Team Zipporah because I only ship cannon ships. That way, my ship never sinks. Again, you could make the argument that the thought process was give Moses somebody he was really close to growing up. That way, what he ultimately has to do to the country he grew up in is more of a personal struggle. But if you're going to do that, couldn't you maybe expand on... I don't know, his relationship with Ramesses? Like that other movie? Yes, I know Prince of Egypt came out decades later, but it is just... It is strange to think that the movie that popularized the notion that Moses and Ramesses were brothers in the first place is the one that didn't do anything really interesting with it, opting for a love triangle instead. It just... It's so Hollywood. How Hollywood can you really get? Number 8, Jesus' Contemporary Resurrection, the Jesus 1999 miniseries. This miniseries starts to wrap up okay. Jesus appears to the apostles, gives Thomas this whole spiel about having faith, then he quotes the Great Commission, and then a beam of light appears and Jesus vanishes, and then the curtain opens and reveals modern day, 
and then Jesus walks out onto the street, waves at someone off screen, and then a crowd of children come running excitedly toward him. Unsupervised children, mind you. And he shouts, What's up? And hugs them all. And then they walk off to parts unknown together, and that's how it ends. I get what they were going for by having Jesus appear in the present. It's supposed to show that Jesus is still relevant. And it's a payoff to those scenes earlier in the miniseries where Satan tempts Jesus by showing him glimpses of the future and having him contemplate his own legacy and whether what he's going through is even worth all of it. But it's just so painfully 90s. You can't really resolve children starving to death with walking down a street and hugging some American kids. Having a cutesy scene is not the resolution to the crises you brought up miniseries. Either handle serious issues with some degree of intelligence and empathy, or don't bring them up at all. Sheep Children, 80. This semi-sequel miniseries to the very successful Jesus of Nazareth miniseries is about the early church and the lives of the Caesars, and the two stories intertwine at various points throughout the series, finally coming to a head when Nero blames the Christians for the fire of Rome. History tells us that Nero, in particular, liked to feed Christians to the lions in the famous Roman Colosseum. So, first, a man has to defend his wife against a leopard. Alright. Some virgins are fed to some tigers. Sure. Then, some little kids, dressed as sheep, come running out to the arena to be fed to some wild dogs. And just for extra kicks, they're actually going, ba ba. I'm not making this up, I swear. What? <laughs> then, just when all seems lost, some Christians come bursting out of the backstage, back Coliseum, whatever, and fight and defend the children and save their lives. To Nero's approval? That's a little out of character. Anyway, this whole climax is just like something that would come out of out of an episode of Story Keepers. Those of you who don't know what that is, that was a cartoon in the 90s about the early church during the Nero years. And that's exactly what is wrong with this climax. It is cartoony in every sense of the word. And then they all lived happily ever after and crucified Peter in the next scene. Number six. Battle against the Egyptians, Solomon and Sheba. The parts of the Bible about Solomon are among the least story-driven out of the entire narrative books, but that did not stop this movie from trying to fit it into the standard biblical epic formula of the time. Boy, Solomon and Sheba wanted to be the Ten Commandments really badly. We don't have time to get into all of this, but suffice it to say, the invented climax sees Solomon leading Israel's armies against an entire horde of Egyptian chariots. Why Egyptians? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And he's using a battle plan that God beamed into his head the night before. The plan involves waiting until the Egyptians are about to get to them, then flipping around their really, really shiny shields so that the Egyptians are blinded and all fall into a ravine. Problem number one, the sun was in their eyes is seriously how you're ending an international war. Problem number two, you mean to tell me that the Egyptian scouts didn't know they would be fighting near a giant ravine? If they survived, they should be executed for failing this spectacularly. Problem number three, you may be able to pick off a couple of the front line chariots using this method, but the ones behind them going to notice that something's going wrong? Aren't they going to hear the horses and humans screaming and careening to their death and then veer off to the side? But no, the entire cavalry dies this way. They just keep going and going. They line the ravine floor with corpses and chariots. It is nuts. Solomon slain his thousands, David slain his ten thousands, and Solomon just got lucky. Number five. This is suicide, the greatest story ever told. To say the greatest story ever told made some odd choices would be a bit of an understatement. 
But by far the strangest choice was how Judas Iscariot ends it all after betraying Jesus. Now in the narrative, this is a pretty straightforward part of the story. He feels guilty, he throws his money down, occasionally at the priests, and then goes off and hangs himself. Pretty straightforward. Don't really need to expand on it. But for some reason, this movie decided to have Judas climb up onto a giant flaming altar, and in the full version, he still has the rope around his neck, even stranger, close his eyes, spread his arms wide out in cross arms, and then drop himself into the fire. What? Okay, first of all, why does he still have the rope around his neck? Two, what was wrong with the way he does it in, this, in the book? Finally, why a giant altar? I feel like this movie is trying to be symbolic, but I don't get it. Is the implication that Judas is the sacrifice for the sins of mankind? Last time I checked, isn't that what the other guy was for? I don't know. I don't get it. Number four, the crucifixion scene, the Jesus 1999 miniseries. When it comes time to crucify Jesus in this show, they make a number of odd choices. The first is that after Jesus says his famous Father forgive them for they know not what they do line, a fictional historian whose job it is solely to give Pilate someone to talk to responds, we know exactly what we're doing, Messiah. We're killing you. Um, burn? Whose idea was it in the writing process to give this line a comeback? Usually when you're adding your own lines into a biblical adaptation, you're either setting up a canonical line or commenting on it. This isn't a setup, so what's the commentary? That... Rome was responsible and exempt from Jesus' forgiveness? All of Rome? Even if that's the case, why is it phrased like something out of an 80s Saturday morning cartoon? And not a good one at that. We know exactly what we're doing, Messiah. We're killing you. <laughs> okay, so G.W. Bailey doesn't actually cackle, but he might as well have. It doesn't help that the following line, one of the women says, they've given him something to stand on. Why? To which John replies as melodramatically as possible, so he'll die slower. <laughs> Jesus movies put a stand on the cross all the time. And the reason is pretty obvious. The actor needs something to stand on in order to stay on the cross. I have never seen a movie feel the need to provide an in-universe explanation for why you're not actually going to be nailing Jeremy Sisto's feet to the cross. It's just... The crucifixion scene is supposed to be one of the saddest parts of the movie, but throughout this whole thing, you just find yourself giggling inappropriately. You probably shouldn't giggle during a crucifixion scene. Unless it's the life of Brian. Okay, that's fair. Number three, Mrs. Potiphar. Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. In the book of Genesis, there's a scene where Joseph is accused of raping Potiphar's wife, for which he is sent to prison. This has presented something of a problem for adaptation since they're often directed at children. Uh, Joseph, King of Dreams in particular, danced around the subject like an expert ballerina, referring to Joseph betraying Potiphar. Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat steers hard into the other direction. And rather than cleaning it up, they make it dirtier. Mrs. Potiphar, sporting some Schumacher Batman-esque nipples on her dress, has some servants drag Joseph closer to her, and then they all break out into a spontaneous orgy. Problem number one. When Potiphar does burst in the door, he only sends Joseph to prison, completely ignoring everyone else who was cavorting with his wife. Problem number two. This situation isn't even demanded by the lyrics in this scene. They would make perfect sense if you still showed him running away as he does in the book. So why? Problem number three, and most important, 
this movie is being presented as a play within a movie being performed in front of school children. So not only are they going out of their way to be less family friendly than a rape accusation, they are canonically doing so in front of kids. Ugh. Number two, the fire of God, Moses, Egypt's great prince. Oh, UAV, the direct -to video producers responsible for such timeless classics direct video knockoffs of whatever was popular at the time. He did The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Hercules, Anastasia, and of course, The Prince of Egypt. These movies were stupid. There is no bones about it. These were some dumb cartoons. Now, to a certain degree, I can forgive dumb in direct video knockoffs of popular movies. I can forgive giving Moses a talking dog and Ramesses a talking cat. I can kinda forgive your decision to name said cat Ever Kitty. Ann Baxter's a kitty cat now? Apparently. Oh. I can almost forgive all the mummy puns. Oh, so many mummy puns. But what I can't forgive is the fact that you felt the need to introduce the fire of God, MacGuffin. You really thought the story of Moses needed a MacGuffin. So, an opening narration explains that long ago, when Pharaoh took the Egypt took the Hebrews hostage and made them his slaves, he stole from them an ancient relic called the fire of God. And it's a literal fire, in case you're wondering. This fire is apparently supposed to reveal the identity of God's chosen deliverer. Funny, I always thought that that's what the burning bush was for, but whatever. Moses finds this flame of God, and it shoots into his chest, making him sparkle like a twilight vampire. And if that wasn't bad enough, this fire comes shooting out of his chest again, like a laser, at moments of great need, such as when Pharaoh dangles him from a pyramid. D d don't ask. The fire of God comes shooting out of his chest again into all the Hebrews, so they all have the fire of God in them and are suddenly content with their slavery for some reason, I think. It, the climax is a little confusing here. Then Moses goes off into the wilderness for an unexplained reason and encounters the burning bush anyway. So, if you were going to include the burning bush anyway, what was the point of the fire of God, MacGuffin? I don't know! I don't either! Here's the thing. There's taking creative liberties, and then there's just making stuff up. And... Gotta consider that to a lot of people, these stories are sacred. Genuinely sacred. They're stupid, and then they're stupid to the point of blasphemy. Faith isn't magic. There's no magical MacGuffin that comes shooting out of your chest at times of need because you have God. That is not how God works, and it is insulting to children's intelligence to make it that way. Take the source material seriously, at least to a point where you're trying to give it some dignity. I can guess that my guess that they figure, hey, these are for kids, and kids are stupid. Well, then what's number one's excuse? The number one strangest Bible movie moment is... Noah's Ark being attacked by pirates! What? Oh, you'll see. I'm so concerned. You should be. 
We're about to get holy, holy, holy. Welcome to Faith on Film. I'm Nathan. Ah, dang it. I forgot what number we were on. Is it number, number four? Number four? Pretty sure it's number four. I'm a dummy. It's okay. Well, I just said it's okay that you're a dummy. May well indeed be an orgy.